also had a Tony Boyle-Arch Research Council and postdoctoral fellow from the Department of History in Trinity, where he was awarded his PhD. And he was also a postdoctoral researcher on letters of 1916, a project that was held in the um, Indian University. He's editing a memoir by Owen McNeil for the Irish Manuscript Commission. And he's also author of the uh, biography on Michael Mann's 16 Live series. So we welcome please, Dr. Brian Hughes. Historians have been almost universally critical of Malin's tactics during the Easter Rising, and this is something that I will briefly address. The lights are coming down. Um, this is atmosphere, I presume. Um, and also, I would like to, I think it's, it's, it's only appropriate, given the venue for today's talk, that I have give some discussion of Malin's time in this very building. Uh, which, as we all know, wasn't as a student. I'll finish by referring to Agnes Mallon, who was pregnant at the time of her husband's execution in 1916, and their five children, and by doing so, perhaps give some little sense of the personal consequences of the Easter Rising. Um, Mallon was born in the Liberties of Dublin, on the 1st of December 1874. He was the eldest of 11 children, six of whom lived to adulthood. His father John was a boatwright and a carpenter and his mother a silkwinder. Uh, his mother's family, not unusually for the time, had connections to the British Army, in particular the Royal Scots Fusiliers. She had uh, brothers who were members. But she herself is said to have developed nationalist sympathies having witnessed the attack on the, that, on the prison van that led to the execution of the Manchester Martyrs. Mallon, as a young man, was very close to one of his uncles, James Dowling, who had been a member of the Royal Scots Fusiliers. And under his influence, at least to some degree, he joined the British Army on the 21st of October 1889 at the age of 14. Now, he's said to have joined, it, it was the band that convinced him. He wanted to play music and he wanted to be part of the army band rather than any other motivation for joining. And his mother apparently wasn't best pleased with his decision. Uh, this is a record from his account ledger from the, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, and you get a description of Mallon as a very young man. You can see he's aged 14 from the parish of St. Catharines. Um, he was four feet five inches in height, never to be a very tall man. Um, you can see he's got fresh complexion, grey eyes, brown hair, and his religion is listed as Roman Catholic. And Malin, in his adult life, was a very devout Roman Catholic indeed. You also see his signature there at the bottom as well. Uh, this might be a little bit more difficult to read. Uh, this is his, or a page from his army service record. Um, it just lists various, you might say, milestones in his army career, beginning with his attestation as a boy, a drummer boy, in October 1889. He was appointed or, or promoted to drummer in January 1891. That's the highest rank that he was to achieve. Uh, and the rest of the entrants are for good conduct pay that was granted at various points throughout the rest of his career in line with sort of army regulations. Um, his army career began, or, or he spent the first number of years of his army career in on what was called home service, which would have included periods mostly in England, but also in Ireland as well. Uh, but in 1896, his regiment, the, the 1st Battalion, was sent to India. And he would spend over six years in India uh, as part of the British Army there. This is an image taken around 1900 of Malin in his British Army or Royal Scots Fusiliers uh, uniform. Um, he saw active service on one campaign or during one period so over about a year or so from 1897 to 1898 during what was called the Tira campaign um, it, which took place kind of around modern day modern day Pakistan but also Bengal the Punjab sort of in northern India. He was quite lucky in some ways in that he only suffered one very small wound in action, a bullet uh, hit a piece of rock and the ricochet came up and hit him and struck him in the face. Um, and it's not actually clear if he ever fired a rifle in combat. His role was as a bugler. 
uh, and that was the role he seems to have carried out uh, while he was while he was on active service over this one year period. He was though a very good shot, and we can see that from another page from his account ledger. And you know, hopefully you can you can read that. But you'll see on the on the right hand side as you look at it. Uh, in mus musketry classification, you'll see he achieves the grade of marksman uh, each year from 1894 up to 1901, 1902. And at, uh, on at least one occasion, he won an award as the best shot in his company. So many of those who are out in the Easter Rising are described as being good shots. But Malin has the uh, rec records to prove it. And a few people talk about his, his, uh, his shooting prowess in their accounts of the Easter Rising as well, those who who served under him. This is his medal that he received for the Tira campaign or for his time in India. It's the Punjab Frontier Medal and you'll see it has the Tira clasp which is the little clasp up above and I think it is revealing that he kept that medal, that that medal stayed in family possession. Malin was someone, as I'll talk about very soon, who grew to you might say hate the British army, who grew to hate British imperialism. But he was proud of his own individual service and he clearly felt some sort of attachment to those who he served with, even if he was opposed to the cause. So he kept the medal here. He also kept a pocket watch that was given as a, as a kind of a gift or memento when he left the army and apparently kept also a kind of a silk mural of the arms of the Royal Scots Fusiliers that he had made himself. So I think there's an interesting relationship with his British Army service there. There were three main consequences to Malin's service in the British Army, his time particularly in India. The first is as a very serious case of malaria, which he contracted while on active service. He was forced to sleep outside of his tent for fear of attack and he contracted this very serious case of malaria. He was ill for quite a number of months, lost about two stone in weight, and would, for the rest of his life, suffer recurrent symptoms of that malaria. So he would appear intoxicated or shaking or, or whatever the case may be, as, uh, and this would appear sporadically over the rest of his life. And even while in India, he spent a number of separate periods hospitalised um, with, the, with the malaria. The second... Uh, is his relationship with Agnes Hickey. He met Agnes Hickey in 1896, just before he was sent to India, through a family friend who had been in the Royal Scots Fusiliers with Malin. She was born in 1879. Her father was a Fenian. He'd been exiled for his part in the rebellion in 1867. And he was initially less than impressed to have a British Army soldier appearing at the house but seems to have overcome this initial scepticism and, and grown quite fond, although he did die. I think he died around 1900, 1901, so um, they, they didn't meet again after his service in India. Um, they kept up a correspondence while he was in India and became engaged through this correspondence. And I think in many ways it's a very remarkable courtship in days where, you know, a time when it would have taken several months for a letter perhaps to, to go, make it one way or the other, they kept a courtship up for six years, having not seen each other, um, and they actually became engaged via letter as well. And she did have a suitor at home as well, a little bit closer to home, but she eventually rebuffed him in favour of, of Malin. Um, her, I think she also had a very big impact in the third key consequence of Malin's time, in India, which was the development of nationalist and particularly socialist sympathies. Uh, that development can be seen through the letters that he wrote to Agnes Hickey while he was stationed in India. Unfortunately, we only have one side of the correspondence. He lost a rucksack with her letters in it, which is a real shame. But in those letters, you get several examples of a growing nationalist and social sympathy. He starts to social, or to sympathise very strongly with the native tribes and with the local people against whom he is supposed to be uh, fighting. He starts to associate the poverty that he witnesses in India, probably comparing it to the poverty that he witnessed growing up in Dublin. And the common denominator really becomes the British Army. And he starts to really question the cause for which he is his fighting and comes to 
develop very strong anti-imperialist ideas. And just to give you a sense of, of that development, some quotes from some of his letters from this time. Uh, in one letter he wrote, the war is lasting a very long time, dear. We ought to leave the poor people alone, for I'm sure they will never give in and they've proved brave men. God help them, if I were not a soldier, I would be out fighting for them. In another letter he said, I wish it was for Aaron that I was fighting and not against these poor people. Uh, again, in another letter he said, I'm very proud, dear, to have a medal. This is just after he'd received his medal from the Tira campaign but would be far prouder if it was for Ireland I earned it. And just after his period of active service ended and when he was under the impression or when he understood that he could no longer be called to active service, he wrote, all the chance of being killed by fighting for the robber flag that I'm serving under is all over. If ever I am to die by bayonet or bullet, I hope it is against it for Ireland. So perhaps an unintentionally prescient comment there. He left the army in 1902 and was married to Agnes Hickey in 1903. He began work shortly after his marriage as a silk weaver in Messrs Atkinson and Co, which is a, a well-known poplin factory in Dublin at the time. And the family moved around Dublin. They generally lived on the south side of the inner city, but they moved on to a number of different houses, which was not entirely uncommon for people of their socio-economic background at the time. People tended to move around even within a very short distance. By 1911, he was living uh, at Mead Street uh, with his three eldest children, the first three children who'd been born. Again, it's possibly not very legible, but you'll see uh, on the top line he has written husband rather than this, what you're supposed to write, which was head of family. That's been corrected by the enumerator. Uh, I'm not sure if that writing husband rather than head of family was a sort of an expression of equality of, of the sexes or if it was just a mistake. Um, we'll have to speculate on that one, I'm afraid. Um, you might also notice, if you can read it, that in the age column he's written 34. He was 36 <laughs> at that stage. So he at least felt a couple of years younger than he actually was. Um, he's also put his, his rank or profession down as silk weaver. The three children are James, later known as Seamus, uh, John, later known as Sean, and Una, who was the, the, the eldest daughter. Uh, after this, uh, two more children were born to Michael and Agnes. Joseph, who was born in 1914, and who is still alive at 102 years of age, and Maura, who was born three months after her father's execution. Uh, this is an image of Malin, probably in his late 20s, early 30s, um, taken in Dublin after, so this is after his British Army career. You see he's grown a quite dashing moustache by this stage. Um, his first involvement in political activity comes with the Silk Weavers Trade Union. Certainly by 1908 he was Secretary of the Trade Union, which is quite a quite a meteoric rise in some ways in, in that he'd only joined the profession around 1903. A standard apprenticeship would be about seven years and it's not entirely clear if he had to undergo a full seven year impression because he seems to have done some silk weaving while in the British Army, so he may have, have been able to, to, to join, to go straight in without the, some of the other formalities. He was allowed to join the profession on the basis that his mother had been a silk winder, so this was a very closely guarded trade at this particular time, trade undergoing a fairly significant revival um, in the early, in the kind of 1910s, early 19, um, kind of turn of the 20th century. Um, he came to prominence certainly in trade union circles and in wider social circles most prominently in 1913. Uh, 1913 is best remembered for the lockout which began in August but there were a number of industrial disputes in the city in the months preceding the lockout and a silk weaver strike was one of those and Malin as secretary of the union was head of this strike he was the figurehead he attended trades council meetings he was the the, the kind of leader in any negotiations with the employer. He also wrote articles that were published in newspapers, particularly newspapers with social sympathies, The Irish Worker, for example, which was published by James Larkin. <coughs> and he became in quite close contact, particularly with Larkin, but also with James Connolly at this time. 
the strike lasted for about four months um, and was ultimately successful. The full terms were never disclosed, but it seems to have been a, a victory for the workers, although one that presumably came at a cost, given four months out of work for a man with a very young family. He left the Silkweavers Trade Union in somewhat acrimonious circumstances. In 1914, he was effectively sacked. The chair of the union claimed that he hadn't been keeping the books to the standard that was required. Mallon himself claimed that it was a small group of people who wanted him out and that he'd been dismissed at a meeting that didn't have a quorum. This went to court and he was legally obliged to return uh, the union's books. He then became a member of the ITGWU, or the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, and was actually appointed the organiser of the Inchicore branch in late 1914. And the family moved to Emmet Hall, which was owned by the ITGWU, and they, they lived there up until the surrising the family actually stayed there for a period afterwards as well. At some point in 1914, he joined the Irish Citizen Army. He doesn't seem to have been a member when that body was founded around November 1913 to protect Dublin striking workers from the potential brutality of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. But at some stage in 1914, he became the organiser of a local branch in the Inchicore area. And by October 1914, he'd been appointed Chief of Staff or second in command. This is at the time when James Connolly took over as commandant and one of the first things he did was appoint Mallon as his second in command. Again, something of a meteoric rise to the top of the organisation. Uh, he's, his role largely revolved around training and organisation and the drilling of men. And it's probably, it's almost certainly uh, to a large degree down to his British Army background that he was given this position. By all accounts, he was considered a popular and well-liked leader. Certainly people who write after the Rising are very unlikely to say anything, anything otherwise. You tend to find very little negative commentary about the leaders of the Rising from those who, who took part themselves. But even in contemporary newspaper reports, again, from the Workers' Republic, so not exactly an impartial source, but generally they make a point of, of referring to him as a, as a popular and well-liked leader. So he seems to have been, been an effective and, and, and quite a good drill leader. Uh, his character, by all accounts, he was a quiet, softly spoken man. In his adult life, he was a teetotaler. He was also an accomplished musician. He learned a number of musical instruments while in the British Army. And after he left, he spent quite a bit of time conducting fife and drum bands in particular and won a number of awards for those um, for his, his conducting of, of these bands. And one of those medals actually still survives in the Kamenum Jail Archive. One way, he made some money on the side by teaching local children uh, various musical instruments like the bugle, the violin, uh, the flute, for example. Uh, and a flute owned by Mallon as well is also in the Kamenum Jail Archive. In 1966, his eldest son wrote a number of articles about his father, um, and these were published in the Irish language newspaper in you uh, and recently a couple of years ago released a, as a small book or a pamphlet by Conor Nagelga and in those articles he, he talks to his father as having loved ancient history the history of South America in particular he also was a fan of the novels of Joseph Conrad he was a dedicated and patient family man but not a particularly successful breadwinner he was not very good with money, it seems. He had a number of unsuccessful business enterprises. The most unusual of these, uh, particularly for a man who was an ex-soldier who grew up in inner city Dublin, in 1913, towards the end of 1913, he attempted to run a chicken farm in Finglas. A slightly unusual career move. Um, unfortunately, he was struck down with a very serious case of Bright's disease um, from which he nearly died, and any money that they had for the business had to go into his medical care, and the family moved back to Dublin shortly afterwards. He also seems to have opened up a short-lived cinema in the city centre as well, a picture house that showed American films, um, which again seems to have been financially unsuccessful. He also hosted a number of concerts as well. Some of these made money, some of them lost money, um, and certainly it would appear that Agnes was down to hurry to keep things going financially and that she was a very prudent woman and, and was very good with money.
in a way that he wasn't. He was also a very strongly principled man and had very little time for those who failed to meet his own high standards of commitment. So there's a contrast there between the very patient father with the, the man who wasn't so patient about those who didn't share his political uh, or ideological commitments. Now, Malin is best known for his participation in the Easter Rising, which is one week of a much longer life, but a very significant week in terms of Irish history. Um, he was appointed in, in the days leading up to the Easter Rising, he was given the rank of Commandant and put in charge of St Stephen's Green, which was to be occupied by members predominantly of the Irish Citizen Army. Now, as the Rising went on, several members of the Irish Volunteers joined the garrison as well when they couldn't make contact with their own units but the idea was that he would control a citizen army contingent uh, at the green on easter monday uh, malin's men and women occupied the green they ejected those who'd been enjoying the sunny bank holiday um, bank holiday monday took a couple of prisoners those who were there in british army uniform were kept as prisoner and they locked the gates barricaded made some barricades around the, the green at various strategic points and proceeded to dig trenches in the green for cover. At some stage on Tuesday morning, very early uh, in the early hours of Tuesday morning, a small group of British Army soldiers made their way from Kildare Street into the Royal Co or, sorry, into the Shelburne Hotel, where they brought a machine gun to the fourth floor and they proceeded to rake St Stephen's Green uh, in the early hours of Tuesday with machine gun fire and this prompted a an evacuation of the garrison there which given the fairly hectic and dangerous circumstances seems to have been carried out in a remarkably orderly fashion malin and markovich kentis markovich who'd been appointed as malin's second in command on the first day of the rising were the last to leave um, they did suffer a number of casualties, but the majority of the garrison made it into the Royal College of Surgeons. So this is uh, Stephen's Green. If you can imagine Stephen's Green now, if you imagine the shrubbery or the bushes that surround the railings, um, they were far less well developed than they are now. So actually, if you imagine the kind of cover they would have had now, it was much less sufficient uh, at, those uh, at that stage. And this then is the Royal College of Surgeons. This, the college was originally occupied on Easter Monday and this became their headquarters or, or, or their main post for the remainder of Easter week. There were a number of smaller outposts in the area surrounding the green and the college. Malin's key strength, it seems, as a leader uh, during the Easter Rising was discipline um, and compassion for those under his command. Uh, Madeleine French Mullen, who served under him in a diary written after the event, wrote, The Commandant M. Mallon I hardly knew by sight that Easter Monday when I was placed under his command, but at the end of the week I knew him better than many life acquaintances. I don't know what struck me most about the man, perhaps his wonderful patience and self-control. I've known him long hours without either food or sleep, and yet he would never show the slightest sign of irritation under the most exasperating circumstances. He thought of everyone and everything, not merely the important matters, but little details as regards our comforts that few men would even think of. Uh, this is, I suppose, the sort of thing that's not necessarily likely to draw the attention of military historians and those interested in tactics and procedure and that sort of thing. Uh, the discipline in particular can clearly be seen in his time in this building. Uh, William Oman, who was a member of the Citizen Army, who was initially stationed at Jacob's Biscuit Factory, in his statement to the Bureau, Bureau of Military History, he contrasted uh, the atmosphere and the discipline in Jacob's with that in the Royal College of Surgeons, where the garrison were required to uh, make their beds every morning. They were required to say the rosary every day as well. Um, there was no laughing, joking, or any sort of joviality allowed, particularly where the sick or wounded were kept. Um, and you can see this with Margaret Skinner. Margaret Skinner was very badly wounded uh, during an attempted attack around the area of the Russell Hotel. And it was feared at the time that she would, she would actually die of her wounds. Um, and 
Thomas O'Donoghue, who was part of the garrison, was forbidden from playing uh, a bagpipe, set of bagpipes that he found in the college because, you know, out of respect for the very seriously wounded Skinner. Uh, he was very clearly keen to prevent any unnecessary damage to the building or to property. Uh, Dermot Coffey, for example, was later told by Lawrence Kettle, who'd been taken prisoner in the Royal College of Surgeons, that there was a lot of boys from the roughest parts of the city, but that they even took the trouble not to drop cigarette ashes on the carpets. When one of the young men slashed a portrait of Queen Victoria to make himself a set of putties, he was severely rebuked by Mallon, who was no fan of Queen Victoria, um, and had actually refused to contribute to a memorial to Victoria during his time in the British Army. And this is um, a picture from the, the, the college here, from their collection, but it was republished in the Irish Times. Um, this is what was left of the portrait after the, the, the slashing. And I think a piece of what was slashed was recently went on auction, if I'm yeah, correctly... Yeah, did you, I don't know, you didn't buy, you didn't buy it yourselves, which is, which is a shame. It always pains me to see these things uh, and you don't know where they may end up. Um, he also threatened to shoot anyone else who had damaged, who, who would damage property in the building afterwards. Um, the College of Surgeons, as I said, was initially taken on Easter Monday and it was taken, it seems, because they had intelligence that there was a set of rifles in the college. Now you might wonder why would a place of learning and medicine have a set of rifles, but there was, not unusually for the time, an officer training corps attached to the college. These are um, military units that are linked to universities. There was one in, in Trinity College as well, for example, and members of the university would get military training. Uh, as part of these, these, these officer training corps. So um, they were looking for the OTC's stash of rifles, which they eventually found on Thursday. It took them quite a few days to, to dig them out. Um, and after the rising, the registrar of the college wrote to the British authorities to seek the return of these rifles. So the rifles were all surrendered after the rising, and um, they looked to get them back. Um, and you'll see they got a reply. So uh, the image on your left is the letter originally from um, the registrar, and then the reply from uh, Irish Command is that there have been a set of rifles and bayonets set aside for them that they can come and collect from uh, the Ordnance Depot at Island Bridge. Um, you'll also notice in the letter from the registrar, he writes that I'm happy to inform you that comparatively little malicious damage has been done in the college. Now that's not to say the place didn't, didn't, you know, wasn't in a bit of disarray afterwards, but um, certainly perhaps co compared to what they might have expected, it doesn't seem to have fared too badly. Um, the criticism that has been directed against Mallon uh, for his tactics during Easter Week comes really before the garrison entered the, the college here. Uh, this building wasn't particularly strategically significant but it was very sturdy and they were relatively safe and secure in the building here. Um, so it's really the, the digging of trenches in the green and the failure to occupy the Shelburne Hotel that have drawn most attention. I think much of the criticism is probably justified and whatever rationale you might come up with for the decision to do this, it certainly didn't work. Um, and the digging of trenches was a, a resolute failure. But it remains unclear to what extent Mallon himself was directly responsible for the choice of tactics. Liam O'Brien, who was one of the volunteers who jumped the fence uh, at the Green on Easter Monday to join in, has stated during that during a conversation in Richmond Barrack, Barracks after the surrender, Mallon had told him that he'd been critical of the original plans for the rising and had asked, where is the alternative plan for use when this one breaks down? This plan is far too clockwork and there should be an alternative plan. Mallon's wife seems to have been surprised to hear of the surrender as she had expected the rebels to retreat to um, the hills or, or to leave Dublin and to continue a sort of guerrilla war after it become unfeasible to stay in Dublin. Um, and it seems that Mallon had spoken of this to her in the weeks leading up to the Rising. Um, it also seems that some of those who had been under Mallon's command were under the same impression before the official surrender order actually came. Uh, in contrast to this, Tom Clark's widow, Kathleen Clark, suggested 
in the 1960s that the military council had never intended to occupy Stevens Green and that when they found out that it had been occupied an order was sent to Mallon to leave immediately which he disobeyed. Uh, this claim was very sternly refuted by Frank Robbins who was a member of the Irish Citizen Army uh, but a Limerick volunteer who was part of Mallon's, Mallon's garrison told the Bureau of Military History that he had seen an order from Connolly to evacuate the Green by dusk and that Mallon had refused, later announcing, it is my life's ambition to defend the Green and that he would defend the Green from inside the Green. And it does seem out of character for Mallon, a military man, to have directly disobeyed an order from James Connolly and he certainly, whatever his thoughts about the surrender was he obeyed Connolly's order to surrender and it was directly under Connolly's orders that Mallon's garrison surrendered um, and it, it, it does seem as I say a little bit out of character a little bit odd that he would do this and um, but by occupying the green and by digging trenches in the way he did he also deliberately ignored some of his own writings about guerrilla warfare in 1915 he published a number of articles in the Irish Worker based on guerrilla warfare in India while he was there. And, and certainly the sort of things that he's advocating there bear no resemblance whatsoever to what actually happens really anywhere in Dublin during Easter week. So that's quite, quite unusual. Um, and the kind of contradicting testimony here probably doesn't help. And I think this is a, certainly in terms of responsibility for the tactics is a mystery that will have to remain unresolved I think so Malin really may have been following orders of which he was skeptical but once he'd begun to carry them out was very keen to see them through to the end or he may have been entirely responsible for those tactics um, and tactics that failed rather resolutely but the debate continues on that one after the surrender Malin and his garrison were brought to Richmond barracks he actually walked past his family home on the way there um, which was empty, barring the family dog. Uh, and he was separated from the rest of the rank and file, marked out as a leader, and court-martialed on the 5th of May. Now, in the surviving record of his court-martial, he downplayed his own role, suggested that he was following the orders of Constance Markovich, and at her request had taken over command of the men, which was very clearly untrue. Um, so certainly that court martial record as it stands, um, his account given in that bears very little resemblance to the facts of the matter. Um, so it would appear to be a very clear attempt to avoid the firing squad. Um, and I suppose we have to look at that attempt really in the context of a man who did not want to die. Uh, this is a man who didn't really share any ideas of, of kind of blood sacrifice or, or that kind of very often used but I think not very well understood phrase. Um, he is a man who was very acutely aware of the position in which he had left or he would leave his young family, the, particularly the financial position uh, and this is very clear from other things that he wrote and is said to have done in the weeks before and immediately after the rising as well. This is a man with uh, a very young family, he'd never been a particularly good breadwinner, the family had never been very wealthy and it wasn't entirely certain. He certainly recognised that his wife would be entitled to something as, as the wife of one of the, the leaders of the rising but really there's no certainty about what position they would be left in. His wife was also very heavily pregnant at the time as well. And his despair at leaving his young family behind is, is very clearly and very poignantly put forward in his last letter to his wife. This is just the final page of that letter. And it's a really remarkable piece of writing. I think it's one of the most remarkable to emerge directly from the rising. It is a mix of pride, certainly at the cause for which they had fought and their attempts to, to win Irish freedom, but also at very profound grief at leaving his family behind and, and them having to carry on without him. He asks, for example, his wife not to marry again. Now, he leaves her free in the matter, but, but something of a remarkable request, I think, to make of, 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 a, of a relatively young woman. Um, and I think is reflective of his sort of anxiety uh, at the time and sort of how, how strongly he feels 
about his, his marriage. Uh, he also asked that his youngest son, Joseph, become a priest and that his eldest daughter, Una, become a nun, which is reflective of his very devout Catholicism, but again, a fairly remarkable request to make of your children in, in, in your last uh, actions. Um, you may be able to see it there. It says, uh, Una, my little one, be a nun. Joseph, my little man, be a priest, if you can. Um, and it is filled, as I say, it really is a, a tough read. And I do recommend if you get a chance to read the, the full thing. Um, his family, uh, this is the family that he left behind. This is an image published in the Catholic Bulletin in December 1916 as part of a fundraising drive for the education of the dependents of those uh, who were killed uh, and also those imprisoned after the rising as well. Um, and again, the father is a very obvious, he's very clearly uh, and a very stark uh, absence from the, the photo here. Um, you'll see on the, the left, as, as you look at it, uh, Shane, Mr. James, the eldest, uh, Joseph, who is, is, is just to his, his left end, to, uh, next in from, from the left. Uh, Joseph, you may have heard him recently in the news. He was awarded the freedom of the city of Dublin. Um, he did become a priest. He joined the Jesuit order after the death of his mother in the 1930s. Um, and in the late 1930s, he went to Hong Kong as a missionary and has, has remained there ever since and has had a, a pretty remarkable life in his own right. Uh, Seamus was involved in Republican activism for a period. He joined the anti-treaty IRA uh, after the, the Anglo-Irish Treaty during the Irish Civil War. As a very young man, he was arrested in 1922 in possession of a revolver, which was liable to the death penalty at that stage, but it was considered bad idea or bad publicity to execute the son of a 1916 leader, so he was instead imprisoned. He spent some time in the Curra, uh, where he went on hunger strike for a period in 1923. Um, he was then released, uh, worked in Ireland for a little period, but eventually spent some time in South America and was actually in Venezuela in South America when his mother passed away in 1932, so he was unable to attend the funeral. Um, John, who is the, the next in from the left, uh, standing up there, he also became a Jesuit priest and spent most of his working life in Galway. He was the first of the Malin children to pass away. The baby um, in, in, in uh, Agnes Malin's arms is Maura. She was born three months after the Easter Rising as well. She spent some time working uh, in Spain before returning to live in Dublin. Uh, and then the, the eldest daughter standing there is Una. She joined the Loretta Order um, and spent most of her working life in Spain as well as, as a, a member of the Loretta Order. So, I mean, I think the children had quite varying and, and, and very interesting lives in their own right. And I think it's worth thinking about the families of those left behind, not just of the leaders, but also of those killed in action as well. Um, on, on both sides, I think, and, and also on, on, on no side at all. Uh, Malin herself, or Agnes herself, had quite a difficult life uh, afterwards. She contracted TB in 1924, spent a number of years very seriously ill. Uh, she did recover, but the TB returned in the early 1930s. Um, she was, the family really survived on money given to them by various dependence funds after the rising and also from the White Cross. In 1924, she received an army pension. Um, in 1928, she received a pension of, of 90 pounds per annum uh, and the education of the children was covered until they reached, reached the age of 18. Um, but that education you know, had to be paid for front and reimbursed. And in the army pension file, which is available online, you get lots of letters requesting reimbursement of various fees that were paid. And you get a very strong sense that this is a woman, first of all, for whom the education of her children was very important. And they did get a middle-class education that they perhaps would not have got 
um, in their father's lifetime and that he probably would have been unable to provide. But also one where every penny counts really for the family as well and financially you know, it was certainly a struggle. Uh, in 1928, the pensions for the widows uh, of the signatories was increased. Uh, it was actually doubled to £180 per annum and it was increased on a couple of various occasions over the years. Uh, and she wrote to the, um, the pensions board to request that this be also applied in her case, but was fairly bluntly told the legislation said signatories of, the, of this proclamation. Her husband wasn't a signatory and he didn't, uh, or it didn't apply to her. And I think this really rankled with with Agnes and with the family afterwards, that idea of a kind of a hierarchy between the signatories and those who hadn't signed the proclamation. And, and certainly that stayed in the family memory to some degree or other for quite a long time afterwards. Uh, this is a letter from that pension file. Uh, one of those where she is including, enclosing a receipt or a bill for um, some of the educational bills for the youngest daughter, Maura. Uh, she writes that I'm lying ill for the, for the past six months. I shall have to remain so for six or seven months longer. My pension being very small, I need the money very much. Please forward as soon as possible. Uh, and then at the end she writes, it's difficult to write lying, lying on one's back. I excuse scrawl. Um, and this was December 1931. She died in April 1932. So I think quite a poignant reminder of some of the personal legacies of the Easter Rising and of the execution of her husband. Uh, and she was, certainly by all accounts, very seriously affected by that. Um, so I think I've, I've probably gone on long enough. Um, so I'm very happy to take any questions or, or, or any comments that anyone may have. Thank you very much for your attention.